This morning, I want to I take us through a passage that should be pretty well known as a follower of Christ. But I think it's very important that we visit it this morning. We too often look to lead, look to be the greatest without doing the thing that Jesus said to do, makes us the greatest. So I'm going to read in just a second, but first I'm going to pray. Father God, we, uh, we praise your holy name. God, this morning as we look into your word, may your spirit speak to us. May you show us the places in our life that need to change. May you shine light in the areas where we're not being servants. God, may we be obedient to your word before we've ever read it. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. I'm going to read a rather long passage of Scripture real quick in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not on only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if there is any encouragement, if there is any comfort, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, if you are part of the body of Christ, if you have received from Christ a Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into your life, Paul is saying to the church of Philippi and to us now that we should be of the same mind. We should participate in the same love that Jesus Christ has bestowed upon us, that agape love, that unconditional love that Jesus has has poured out upon us. We should be of the same mind and the same love. And we should have a unity among the body of believers that is because of that love. Unity because of love, because of the gospel. See, there's a couple of things that destroy unity in the church. Selfishness and conceitedness. Obviously, Paul saw something going on in Philippi that that concerned him. And so he's telling them that they need to have the same mind of Christ, which was an unselfish, unconceited mind that put others before himself. What does this mind look like? And what does it start with? I want you to, I want you to look at this passage and look at, at verse 5. And this is what it tells us to have. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, Jesus, the same God who was at the beginning of creation, where it says, let us... Make the heavens and the earth. The same God who by all things 
were created for him, by him, and through him. The same God, the same Jesus who will be preeminent over all things, didn't see it, didn't see equalness with God, something that could be grasped. I want you to just think about that for a second. He was God. He is God. But in the moment of being born as a human, he lowered himself, put himself below God, and didn't think being equal with God was something to be grasped. That's huge. He did this as a picture for us, of what it looked like to be a servant. What it, what it looked like when we become a follower of Christ. We become children of God. We, become, we have all the rights and, and benefits of being a child of God, yet we are called to be servants. We, we have to take that responsibility and say, I don't have equalness with God. And we need to serve. He didn't, he didn't just serve, right? He, he served, he became obedient to God. He was on God's agenda, not his own. He had to be filled by the Holy Spirit so that he could do miracles. And He became obedient to even death on a cross. Losing my page. So that God, in the end, could be glorified. Servants. Servants are always, always about the master's business. If we are called to be, we are called to be Servants of the Most High God, the King. We are called to be about His business. If we are ever going to reach the community, if we're ever going to share the gospel with the people outside of us, outside of these walls, we have got to take on the attitudes of of servants. People don't care what you know until they know how much you care kind of thing. We have to think, stop thinking about ourselves as, as these people, we're saved. It's this idea that we're saved, they're not, our job is not to look at them lower than ourselves, they're supposed to look at them higher than ourselves. See, one of the things I think we need to realize is that we come from the same place they did. They do. We come, we come, we were both, all, all broken, messed up, lost people before Christ found us. And somebody in our life served us in the way of sharing the gospel. You're going to hear me repeat that every time I preach. That's, uh, we, we were not, we didn't come by this on our own. Somebody else brought us to the feet of Jesus. Somebody served us. And, and somebody, Jesus Christ, served them first. So, first, a servant is about the business of the master. Are we about the business of the kingdom of heaven? Are we, are we looking at ourselves and being on our own agenda? Is it about me? Have we made this Christian life about my agenda and my control over the things that happen in my world? I hear it a lot of times, I'll serve if. Or I'll, I'll, 
I'll do that if. That's control. We care more about our own comfort than we do about the agenda of heaven. We care about what we get out of our faith more than what we can give back to our faith. There are people because of our selfishness that are not hearing the gospel or not seeing the true gospel because what they see a lot of times and you see it all you hear it a lot, right? You hear this phrase, all oh, the church is just full of hypocrites. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we are full of hypocrites. And because we're not doing the things that God called us to do. See, serving the Father's agenda at the Master's agenda is messy. The servant of the house in in biblical times, his job was to wash the feet of the people that came into the master's house for dinner. Ever been around stinky feet? It's nasty. They walked everywhere and they didn't wear shoes and socks. The the servant served the master by serving the people that he invited. And they would go and get a bowl and wash feet. Not just one person's feet, everybody that walked through the door. Do we do that? Do we have that attitude where we would kneel down and wash people's feet if they came through those doors? And came to your home While I'm, while I'm learning this sermon, I have to think about these things myself, right? And I think back to, to camp. And I, I think back to, or when we take junior high to camp, we have this worship service. That's, it's called extended worship. And have all these stations where kids can do different things, different acts of worship. Every year. Every year, these kids come, and wa- at least one of them wants to wash my feet. I, and I, I see this beauty of servanthood that these kids are learning at camp. But there's also this reaction in me like, no, no, don't wash my feet. Don't do it. Because that's my job right? That's who I'm supposed to be. I I don't feel worthy to have somebody wash my feet. And, And so, we, as people, are very unworthy. We, we were, at some point, enemies of God. When Christ died on the cross, he was, we were enemies to the kingdom of heaven. This is huge. Christ died on the cross even though we had blasphemed his name and we had we had been enemies. Jesus says this thing about loving our neighbors because servitude servanthood is love, right? This is love in action, serving. Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. The enemies of Christianity. You know, the ones that we usually yell at the TV screen at? Because they're on The View and on these other shows that, you know, we yell at them all the time. How do we serve them? 
Because Jesus would be serving them. The people who, who attack our cities, that hate us because of our lifestyle, how do we serve them? How do we love them? Because the agenda of heaven is to, that God is making a way for the banished person to come home. God is working on sinners becoming children, in grafting people in. And the church has a mission to serve those people who are enemies of the kingdom so that they can become children. That's servanthood. Serving the master's agenda to those who who are enemies, who are... The, the servant is obedient. At least a good servant is obedient, right? We learned that in one of the parables. You know, guy, the parable of the talents, the parable of the good servant, you know, the bad manager. You know, we got all kinds of servant illustrations of what's good and bad in the Scripture. But our greatest illustration is Jesus himself becoming obedient to God no matter the cost. See, the reality is grace, grace is free, but it, but it also costs. It's not cheap. God's grace, we were bought with a price and we're not our own anymore, and so we have a mission we have a responsibility to being bought, bought with a price. So it's called obedience. We become obedient to God's word. Here's just a side note. You can't be obedient to God unless you're in God's word. Because you don't know what God said. You don't know what you're supposed to be obedient to. Because you can't, there's no such thing as obedience without understanding. We, as followers of Christ, have to become obedient again. We've got to stop looking for loopholes. To, in serving God. We, we, we act a lot of times more like Pharisees in the Bible than we do like followers of Christ. Because the Pharisees looked for loopholes. They looked for ways to not serve God, but say they were serving God. You all following me here? You all understand what I'm saying here? They looked at ways to giving and they, 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 there's, a, there's a passage where Jesus talks about um, that they're, they're, they're looking to, to meet the law, but they're missing the spirit of the law. And, they're, they're, and so they're meeting the law, but they're taking little pieces off the edge of their giving and saying, well, it's really not, it's not the whole thing. But the Bible doesn't say that. And so we, we miss the whole idea of what following Christ is with, by trying to, to meet the law without the spirit of the law. The spirit of grace. We come to church without the obedience factor in the rest of our lives. We come to Bible study and never study the Bible. We're, we're looking for ways to say we're good servants without being actually obedient. The last thing in the point about a servant I want to make is the servant never gets the glory. The servant doesn't get the glory. 
The master always gets the glory of the, ma- of the servant's work. Even in Jesus's, in the passage in Philippians, it says, the very last thing it says is that Christ was crucified, died on a cross for the glory of the Father. Christ looked in, into, uh, is praying before the crucifixion. He says he's looking forward to the glory that lies before him. When, when Jesus goes to the Pharisee's house and, and the woman who uh, breaks the oil and, and starts anointing Jesus' feet, the Pharisee complains, right? Jesus tells him, you didn't even provide a bowl of water for my feet. The master not only gets the glory, but he gets the, the results if he fails. Who gets blamed when we fail? We fail to live as servants. Who gets the blame? Who do the people blame? Us? I don't think so. I think people, people look, have a negative view towards God because we fail to be servants. But when we, when we take the leap and become servants of Jesus Christ and follow Jesus, God gets the glory. Because it's not about us anymore. We're no longer selfish and conceited. We're not trying to draw attention to ourselves. We're trying to draw attention to the Father. So let your light shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Our job has always been to bring glory to the Father. God's greatest thought, greatest concern in the whole entire world is his own glory. Everything else flows out of that. The crucifixion in itself The salvation that we experience is about God's glory. Because God is greatest, most glorified when we are satisfied in Him. God is most glorified when we are serving Him and bringing people to the feet of Jesus as servants. Now, how do we do that? Simple. You use the gifts that God has given you for the glory of God to serve others. Serve one another. We are called to be servants of all. We're called to use our gifts. If your gift is to preach, preach for the glory of God. If your is to work with children, you work with children for the glory of God. If your job is, if your gift is to, to play music, use it for the glory of God. Serve others with it. If you, are, if you can do construction, serve others with it. Whatever God has gifted you with, use it for the glory of God. God did not give you gifts for your selfishness. God gave you gifts so they could be used for the glory of God. I'm going to close with this because I, I, I want to ask a question. What would happen if to your family, if every person in your family became a servant, right? If, if, your, fa- if, your, if your family took on the attitude of a servant, what would happen? I think the strife and the conflict, and the things, because people are taking, taking on the attitude of the servant, the strife and the conflict would go away. 
the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and those kind of things would be lived out in your family. Because when others are thinking more of others than of self, the conflict goes away. That's what most conflict is, right? It's one person or two people thinking more of themselves than others. It's selfishness. So what would happen in your family? What would happen in this church? Is everybody that's in here right now would become servants of one another, like we're called to be. What would happen? What would happen to this community if we became that kind of servant to the community? On Tuesday, I, set, I stood up here and I looked out at a f- packed house at Michael Mayberry's funeral. And the theme of, of that funeral was servanthood. And we heard stories after story after story of Michael's heart for servants, his servanthood, and to be a servant to others. I want to ask you, If one man's life could fill this place because his servanthood took Jesus Christ, what could all of our lives do? And what would the ripples outside of that be? It would be like throwing a rock in a pond and there's ripples beyond this, this community. If our lives our lives could be those rocks of servants into a giant pond. What would, the, what would the ripples do? That's the question I've been asking myself all week. So I'm asking y'all. As Darren comes back, and I'm, I'm going to pray, and the, the praise band... I ask you to just consider that. To um, to think about what your life would look like if you were a servant. A servant to all. Let's pray. Father God, you alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of life, our lives. You have, you have gone to the cross to save us, to redeem us, to put us on, on mission. God, give us the heart of servants that we may bring you glory in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.